I'm thrilled to be here um, and to present this project today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the project this afternoon. That's a very intimidating lecture to follow. <laughs> and I hope I just get one of those six points <laughs> covered. Um, as the theme is the experience of the urban, it was suggested I present this one project that uh, we completed about four or five years ago. It involves a waterfront redevelopment in Auckland, New Zealand, and it was undertaken with Rate Associates, um, a New Zealand landscape architecture practice. It involves themes of understanding site, um, responding to community, idea of sort of friction, um, the as found, what does the site tell us, and also about reprogramming brownfield sites in an urban context. Other issues relate to fostering relationships between the city and its people, a site that was previously inaccessible. Uh, also questions around civic possibilities in an industrial setting, or how existing uses that were slated for removal could be essential to the site's ongoing viability and experience for the public. Another theme that the project talks about is how new architectures intersect with the as-found conditions of old architectures and how one can foster relationships between old artefacts and new ecologies and how materiality of a place, the specifics of a place, can be an important language of its future design. So a little bit about Auckland, it's on the other side of the world. I hope you get there, <laughs> come and visit us. Um, it's a beautiful city, it's not the capital of New Zealand, but it's the most important trading city of the country. And this map of 1859 by a German um, geologist, Hochstetter, really beautifully captures the quality of the city and its relationships to its topography, its 50 volcanoes, and its harbours. Water is really important for Auckland. It's an isthmus, it's a piece of land between two oceans, the Pacific and the Tasman. And this sort of relationship to water has informed a city that actually has one, every person, every third person has a boat. This is the highest ratio of ownership of boats in the world. So this, this relationship between land, its people, and water is absolutely critical to the story of the city. And this relationship to water has informed some very beautiful architectures about how the land meets the water. So a little bit about the site itself. It began life out in the harbour, the Watamata Harbour. And although settled by Maoris in the 1300s, um, in its English colonial incarnation of the city, um, a grid was laid over the land, as colonial cities do, and streets led down to the waterfront. And over time, because it was a trading port, a series of finger wharfs developed about connecting the land to the sea. And our site uh, was undertaken in two reclamation, land reclamation projects, basically filling land onto the water to make space. The first one occurred in the 1920s, and it was first sort of a linear harbour condition which was offloading timber, coal, oil to the city. And then the second reclamation established a finger promontory which created more land uh, for industry and then a small harbour condition. So the site today it's established industrial, maritime uses, yacht construction, fishing fleets, fish markets, cement batching, storage silos, bus storage and marinas. It's a very rich <coughs> industrial maritime setting. And it was dislocated from the city. It's very close as you can see, but no one ever went into it. It wasn't connected very well. It was primarily used for industry. But the city and the government could see great potential for this place. So this master plan created some 10 years ago by other consultants was established to guide transformation from industry to commercial and residential mixed use. The designers saw this was an opportunity to remove all of the industry, 
or the architecture or the site history as a blank canvas. An opportunity to start again, an opportunity to create a new contemporary city, a new expression. I welcome it. So our site was right in the middle of those two reclamation projects. And it was the first part of the transformation from the old to the new. And we were asked to develop a public space to attract the, commu the community of Auckland onto this site that had been inaccessible before. It's uh, 40 to 60 metres wide, 400 metres long. And the idea is if people, if we could attract people to this setting, um, developers, investors, commercial interests might come. If we attract people, investors may come. But at the moment, it was un seemingly unattractive. But when we first got to the site, this was taken the day we arrived on site, um, once we were commissioned, it was undertaken, uh, demolition was being undertaken. Things were being removed, erased. And the, the government thought the more cleared, the less risk, less problems, less issues, then the site would become more valuable. But we were keen to sort of challenge that idea of removing everything, the tabula rasa. And so we thought by looking at the site in detail, that might inform a different outcome. So it's important for us, and I think to communicate the design process about what was on this site. There was what we call Jellicoe Street, a sort of bare, sort of run remarkable, very broad street back off the harbour condition. Then there was the wharf condition, um, which had some design clues, these rails that used to be transporting the oil and timber back into the city. There was a fishing industry that both loaded ice onto the boats and offloaded the fish each day. It was a sort of a theatre of fishing that was part of the process of that wharf that was to be removed. There was ferries that took Aucklanders up to the outer islands that was located here that was also to be removed. There was a 1940s shed that used to house fishing nets that was to be removed and replaced with high-rise development. It was a sort of a language of the, the maritime coast, these bollards, the sort of fantastic crustiness of patina. Near to the harbour were these storage silos. In the longer term, they will also be relocated and removed. And next to that was this cement batching plant. Both the cement, but it's also stored sands and gravels. And they were stored by these concrete blocks, which were, as you can see, being lined up to be taken off site. And we said, hold on, we might use those. And back next to that cement batching plant was a small harbour that stacked tugs and ferries. And near to that was the super yacht fit out. So there was this sort of grittiness, but also glossiness right next to each other. It was a fantastic juxtaposition of qualities and materials. And across the site was this sort of incredible language of the utilitarian, the functional, the maritime. So it's important for us to understand the detail of the site, but it's also important to understand how it fits into sort of the morphology, the urban pattern of the city of Auckland. And our site there is in orange, and you can see how it's connected by a very strong spine. If you look at it in plan, connects by what's called Key Street, an incredibly important axis that has been broken and severed across its length over many years. And if you strip away the detail, you can see an incredible pattern that is unique to this city, where the grid comes down to meet Key Street, and then there is a series of finger walks that display. So the, the, the grid goes there, and then something interesting happens, and it's creating more protected harbour conditions because of the tidal flows. So if you angle it, it deflects the water. So an incredible interesting pattern in the city that they hadn't seen before and we thought it was important to reflect in the design. So fine grain understanding of site but also big scale understanding of site. And you can see here how that hinge on the left, our site, sort of mediates between the grid and the, and the finger wolves. So we believe the site had qualities that we valued. It was a setting in flux, it was crusty, utilitarian, functional. It was big in scale. It had temporal qualities that engaged our senses. It challenged our typical urban experience. And it's that, that otherness, that difference, is why we were drawn to it. 
and why we shouldn't erase it. And we mapped a whole series of harbour conditions around the uh, Asian region. If you look at them, um, when they, once they're redeveloped, once they're redeveloped, there's a level of sameness and plainness that occurs. The city comes to the waterfront. The very qualities of difference in each of these cities have been removed. And we're very keen to challenge that basic assumption. We think each site is unique and each design should respond to each of those sites. So we developed a series of propositions. One was the idea of bricolage, the ready-made, how we could use the existing qualities of materials and architecture, architectures to inform a design. They're rough, they're tough, they're sustainable, they're on site, why can't we use them? Viable, another theme is viable economies. All of these existing um, maritime industries were to be relocated because they were seen as a problem to development. We thought, actually, that's why the public will go there, because they're actually a dynamic, maritime, authentic experience. Then we had a new complexities. The idea that what will attract people? Yes, there will be maritime activities, but there needs to be facilities for the new community to, to occupy. Recreation, play, dining, music, parties, activities, etc. You add the both together, you get what's called friction. The idea that um, activities of industry and activities of the public are intersecting. That will cause friction. It will slow them down. There'll be interruptions. There'll be pauses. That's actually a good thing. It requires negotiation and communication. Obviously, it was a toxic side of industry, so there was a theme of remediation that's important. Capturing the water, cleaning it before it goes back into the harbour. And the idea of morphology. The idea of urban settlement is unique to each place and how can we respond to that in each design. So the outcome is composed of three components. Jellicoe Street, the harbour and the park. The first is Jellicoe Street. As you can see, it's a bare, wide, unremarkable street, barely a tree in sight. You wouldn't be drawn there. It's back off the harbour. And we imagine this could be a much more immersive place. This is a setting where we might actually introduce the indigenous flora of Auckland, one that had never been seen on the site before. This picture, this painting, was actually um, conceived some 400 metres from our site. And we thought, well, what if we metaphorically brought this landscape back onto this setting? and to provide a much more immersive landscape where transport, circulation, movement, people are immersed in a garden setting, um, hosting for parking, trams, public transport and pedestrian usage. So the first concept saw this as an indigenous landscape which we, get, which we carve out over time. At first we imagined that the landscapes are like emerging through the cracks of the concrete. And at first the landscape was barely evident, but you see the sort of the patterning that was emerging. Two years later, Auckland's incredible in terms of growth of plants. Two years later, the, the, the infrastructure is starting to be immersed into the, into the landscape setting. And it becomes now a sort of a promontory, a pedestrian route in and amongst a garden setting. And each of these gardens are trapping, filtering, connecting um, as via bias wells and rain gardens before it goes back into the harbour. And now people are moving through a garden setting, a complete transformation of what was bare and an unremarkable street environment. We're moving through in terms of vehicles is through a landscape rather than being defined by the circulation system, which provides a series of protected and welcoming public spaces. North Wharf, by contrast, was completely different. It was north facing, which in the southern hemisphere means you get sun. And it was host to both the fishing industry and uh, the ferry service, which were both to be removed because they were going to be blocking views out onto this nice harbour. But we took a bit different point of view. And this, this little sketch was an incredibly, incredibly important drawing um, at the time to convince the government to instead create a public space around the story of fishing, around authentic uses. So we said, well, why can't you have fishing boats loading and offloading on the wharf in which the public participate in that experience, that sort of theatre of event. It's okay to offload and have trucks there and be messy and that they load into a market and maybe the restaurants and cafes could have a seafood thing. Why not? And then that market leads into a wholesale market 
and that was slated for removal, that can actually be an incredibly important public destination. And this cross-section was also important to convey, well, you can have actually held fresco dining and cafes and bars and seafood restaurants, and that can look out onto trucks loading and offloading. That's okay. Why not? And that's ultimately what happened. So what's important is, it's not the landscape architect piece of physical outcome here, it's actually about the retention of industry. That was our role. It's actually not to put something in place, but to, to keep the existing. And the language, the crustiness of the broad pavements, those rails, are actually really important and beautiful quality. And it was okay to be bare and unencumbered and simple, and that the theatre of people moving along this space and looking out onto the industry is part of the experience. So now it's a very successful seafood themed um, destination for Auckland. The language of the architecture is not high rise, it's actually low rise and it's build, um, building upon the scale of those small sheds that were already on site. And they look out onto public seating spaces and the movement of ex those existing uses onto that harbour. And sometimes that view is blocked by boats, but that's a fantastic thing. There's both big fishing industry and also small scale fishing industry that's now using that site. North Wharf works because it's very simple. It's keeping industry, it's allowing movement corridors, and it's providing refreshments next to it. Very simple outcome, and incredibly important for the city of Auckland. And finally, Silo Park, which was the sort of the third piece of the public realm um, conversation for this site. This was the view from above. It's an incredible story of grey. It's not green here. Um, but an incredible opportunity, but a, a, a great challenge as well. And we were very interested in seeing how a design could build upon the morphology, the pattern and the qualities of this setting while introducing public amenity, public activity and introduces another layer of programming to this site. And then, as you know, as you are designers here, design can involve many sketches, many scribbles, many conversations, and that's important. We're trying to weave in ecology, circulation, the as-found conditions, those silos, introducing new industry to the site, recreation, and play and amenity. And this drawing now becomes formalised over time, and what's inter interesting is that, that intersection between the two remediation, the landfill, that sort of hinged wharf, that triangular nature, was trying to respect that and play upon it. So the morphology and pattern of the city is being conveyed in the design. We're especially keen to keep those silos as a memory of past recent history, but also as a way to utilise them for new contemporary uses. So I did this drawing right at the beginning about maybe it could be a adventure tourism destination for the city, bungee jumping, lookouts, projections, climbing, cafe and ticketing, etc. And then we developed more drawings which sort of talked about these as sentinels, gateways to the site, or draw cards from the city to this place. We had to do these drawings to convince the client that it was worth keeping these silos, because otherwise they were going to be removed. Ultimately, they were retained, and now they are the centrepiece of a new park we called it Silo Park. We thought if we named the park Silo Park, they couldn't remove the silos. <laughs> <laughs> and they are forming fantastic gateways from the harbour condition going onto the site from the other side. That otherness I talked about, that sort of scale and sense of quality of this place that was different from the city is certainly revealed here in these silos. Walking through them, gives an incredible sense of scale and grandeur of industry. And now they're being reprogrammed for events, um, exhibitions, video installations, etc. So they're having a multiple use within the structure of the silos themselves. But also they provide a fantastic lookout, um, both to the, the new design, um, but also beyond back into the city. It's sort of a new vantage point that was never accessible to the community before. And this view looks out onto a new architecture. There's the old architecture of the silos that we're reprogramming, but we're introducing new architectures, what we call the gantry, which we wanted to use as a functioning gantry for maritime industry, an event frame, green infrastructure, sort of a vertical garden, a lookout, a playful element, a walkway, and a folly. 
It's also important that it marked the hinge between those two reclamation projects and provided a sort of a portal, a gateway into the industry beyond. It's also important as a sort of a nighttime beacon, as a draw card to this site. Much like the architecture of industry beyond this view, those silos, we were looking at how the language of the architecture could respond in a contemporary way to this site um, and be responsive to the language or the patterning of this site. So it's composed of three by three metre simple grid structures. What that allows for is you can plug and play various programs into, into the structure. So it's a sort of elevated park, elevated seating spaces. They look out onto the silos beyond, sort of fantastic views that are, again, not accessible previously. And they also then look back onto the park itself and have this sort of interchange of dynamism between the program on the ground and above the ground. Those blocks that I showed you in that photograph about they were removing them on, on site, we thought, well, can't we use these as part of an authentic language of this place? So they frame up this new wetland, which um, captures all of the water before it goes into the harbour, cleans it, it frames up that wetland. They are also then used to create these water stairs where the water goes down and cascades into the harbour once it's been cleaned. These blocks will provide access down into the water condition, a place to get your feet wet, also a setting an informal amphitheatre that is now being used for, for programs and events and theatre, etc. It also marks the point of tide um, and it sort of looks as if it's always been there. This is only three years ago. And the blocks are also used for informal seating spaces. The idea of the bricolage, they're already made. Why can't we use the language of the site on, on here in a variety of ways? So they get pre, um, repurposed in different ways and also lit as a sort of a, a dynamic lighting event at night. This park also needed to provide a range of activities for different demographics. Important when you're designing public space, it's not for one demographic, it's for all, and it's about inviting a range of communities to use that space. So, for young to old, the idea of promenading, the idea of active play, immersive garden and wetland experiences, crazy kayak experiencing, <laughs> promenades, a chance to get your feet wet, a chance to look over water, chance to have just simple passive recreation points to and also um, opportunity for unencumbered spaces that allow for a variety of different uses over time that idea of changeability of public space and not actually dedicating a specific use all the time to one space so the idea of markets that can host them on that promenade the idea of concerts and events and parties and the idea of cinema in the public park. So thank you for that. I hope I met some of those six points from Udo. <laughs>